Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we have a special program from the University of Nebraska City Campus. Join us for an hour of good gardening right here on Backyard Farmer. coming to you from UNL City Campus. We are so glad to be here to be able to answer your questions. This is a taped show, however, so you can't phone in. But make sure if you do have questions for a later show, you email those to byf at unl.edu. As always, we start with samples. And Kate, fabulous choice on your part. I'm really excited. So today I brought in some giant silk moths. And I was inspired by a viewer question this week, and it's also National Moth Week kicks off this weekend, so it's very timely. Um, this one in particular is the Cecropia moth, and giant silk moths get their name because one, they're giant, they're the largest types of moths that we get here in Nebraska. This one can get up to five to seven inches in wingspan, and two, they make these um, cocoons out of silk and dead leaves, and it blends in very well, but they're very beautiful moths. Um, they only live for a couple of weeks because once they emerge, they don't have functional mouth parts, and so they just look for a mate, do their business, and lay eggs, but they're pretty fascinating creatures. And very beautiful. You are absolutely right. Very beautiful, right. yes. Awesome. All right, Terry, that's probably contraband on a university campus. <coughs> nope, it is not. It is a tool. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was also inspired by a viewer question that emailed in and they um, asked specifically, Terry, where do you get your soil knives? So this is actually my soiled knife from home. You can see I do use this quite frequently. It is very, um, it will cut you very easily, but this is my soil knife. So if you can find one like this, this is the one I would recommend. Uh, it's got the um, little thing that you can cut with and it's got a scale on it and everything. So, and it's dirty, so you know I use it. <laughs> All right, thanks. Kyle, red bud, dead bud? Uh, well, it's still alive for now, but yeah, red bud. And we, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about herbicide injury versus environmental things versus viruses. And we always talk about with herbicide injury, it will eventually grow out of it. And here we can really see that with, the, with this red bud. And so if we go back to the oldest leaves, we have some leaves that are in pretty good shape here. Um, still, still nice and the right, the, right shape they're, the right shape they're supposed to be. Not, we're not really seeing any of the bootstrapping. And then as we go up to some of the newer leaves, we get some that have very, very characteristic injury of a growth regulator herbicide, where the, some vein distortion, they feel a little bit leathery. But as we go up to our newest growth, our leaves are back to looking good again. So it's, again, we always really want to take a wait and see approach with a lot of, a lot of potential injury things. Is it a herbicide? Is it a virus? Really just wait a couple of weeks. And again, herbicide injury, it should often grow out of it. And this, um, this red bud is back to being happy after having a pretty rough couple of weeks with the, with the, with the bad leaves. And so you're hoping the neighbors don't spray again, right? Well, I may have got it from campus, so. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> he didn't get it from campus. No. <laughs> All right, what did you bring? Well, I brought a branch from a uh, bald cypress. So we get, uh, obviously, a lot of questions about what kind of tree does well for me. I have all these problems between a uh, dry spring, a wet period now where my yard has standing water back to very dry weather. And so as, walking, as I was walking through campus, we have recently, here in the last five to ten years, started using bald cypress in some tough places on campus. If you walk around campus, you'll see them east of the stadium in some very tough areas uh, by the library, again, in kind of some urban settings. And so I've found that uh, once established, the bald cypress seems to tolerate periods of obviously very wet 
period. So if we get a lot of rain, a lot of standing water in certain areas, it's able to handle it just fine. And then also if we have very dry periods, we don't, we're not seeing any dieback in these plants. They're all making it through the spring or through the winter into the spring. Uh, so I think it's something that maybe it's a plant we could consider. And there's a lot of new selections out there right now that are smaller. You know, they're not going to be 50 feet wide and 120 feet tall. They're going to be 15, 20 feet wide, ultimately maybe 30 feet tall. So they're, they're working at developing smaller versions of the bald cypress that could work well in an urban setting. And I love that you made that comment because I want to remind everybody, we are your university. You get to come look at us experiment, mm -hmm. right? Before right. you have to buy it yourself. All right, first uh, round of questions comes to you, Kate. And this comes to us from Holdridge. This viewer says she spotted this interlude <laughs> on a zinnia leaf in the backyard and she wonders what the insect is and is it a good one or a bad one? Yeah, so these are some more cool moths. These are peach tree borer moths and they probably just landed on the zinnia to do their business. And if you don't have any peach trees or related fruit trees in the landscape, you don't have to worry about it. But as their name suggests, the caterpillars will bore into the tree um, around the root zone and uh, in the roots and at the base of the tree too. And they can girdle particularly young trees. So it is something that you'd want to deal with. The time to treat is when the adults are out and laying eggs. And according to this picture, that's now. Um, so you would just do a treatment then and just keep an eye on particularly younger trees. All right. Thanks, Kate. Uh, your second question comes to us from rural western Oto County. Uh, they were goofing around in the yard. They found this tiny little critter, half an inch long. Uh, he either jumps or flies. So what is this? Yes, it does fly. But this is a grouse winged back swimmer. Um, it's an aquatic insect. It's one of our true bugs, so it's related to like somehow stink bugs and other bugs like that. But they're called back swimmers because they're predators, and so they'll actually swim on their backs so they can see in the water to find prey. Um, they're really cool, but they do fly to get from pond to pond. All right, thanks. Very cool stuff. Okay, Terry, your first two pictures come to us uh, from Elizabeth, Colorado, which is zone 5B. Uh, raised garden, four by 10, and a weed barrier down, filled it with plant material, and they thought it would be weed free, and they were quite wrong. They have this grassy weed taking over. He says the, uh, the root system goes a couple feet down, or, or the roots are longer than two feet. What do we think this is? So we had um, quite the discussion about this. Um, I couldn't exactly see like all of the identifying pieces for the grass completely. Um, so I kind of did, um, I talked to Jeff before too. He thought maybe it could be a brome. It could also maybe be some um, perennial um, uh, prairie grass. We're not for sure, but it most likely came in with that soil. So even though people think that the soil is weed free, sometimes it is not depending on where you get it because seeds can actually stay in the soil for sometimes a hundred years before they will germinate. And sometimes all they need is just a, like a flash of light of a car driving by to actually germinate. So my guess is that there's a couple of things that you're going to be able to do. They wanted to keep this organic. So keeping it completely organic would most likely be hand pulling it out. Use your trusty soil knife to get as much of the root as possible. Um, they were also putting lots of mulch down. So that would also help to kind of suppress that to keep um, it from growing. If you can try to keep as much of the growing point clear and dead that would help you if you want to resort to some kind of herbicide then i would probably go with a glyphosate that way you know for sure that it'll get it all right thanks terry you have two questions on the next one also uh, this one comes to us from omaha he says it used to be a zoysia he was trying to get rid of for years and and now he thinks it's spreading into his new grass but he doesn't know if this is grubs or, or is this winter, what is going on here? Winter kill in here? So we've seen some winter kill in zoysia over the past couple of years. So that could potentially be part of what that is. Um, the death of the zoysia from where that is. It's pro most like not most 
not likely not grubs unless you can like literally pull the turf back and the grubs will eat away at the roots. So if you can roll it back, then it would be grubs, but it didn't look like grubs to me. Um, what I would do, it looks very shady also there. So again, you might want to maybe rethink about turf in that area and maybe think about making that more of a landscape bed with some um, herbaceous perennials or small trees or something like that. Would That would take the shade a little bit better. All right, thanks, Terry. Uh, Kyle, two pictures for you on this first one. This comes to us from Beatrice. They want to know what kind of shroom this is uh, at the base of an old uh, tree, and they cut this down just this spring. Yeah, um, so this is one of our caprinus mushrooms. Uh, it's an inky cap, and I think they had also asked some questions about how when they get wet, they just kind of melt and turn right. black and, and ooey and just gross. And that's actually how the inky cap mushrooms will spread their spores. And so I think th this is a, a caprinus variegatus. Um, but as the as they get wet, as they mature, the underside of these of these mushrooms just gets black and oozy, and will attract flies. Often has a bit of an odor to it. And so as we get flies and other insects come to investigate, they'll land on that, and they will then go elsewhere, moving those spores. All right, awesome. So two pictures on the next one, too. This comes to us from Omaha. Uh, it's a honey locust. And uh, you can see the big tree, and you can see kind of the spot where the hammock is uh, attached. And this is what that looks like. So she's wondering if this is a goner. Uh, it is probably not very long for this world. And so I'm not, not entirely sure what, what type of mushroom we have growing in the, here in the crotch of the tree. I'm wondering if it's a type of Oxyporus, um, which is a fairly common uh, wood rotting, a wood rotting fungus that, that we will get. Generally, whenever we're seeing mushrooms that are popping, growing out of the tree or out of the base of a tree, it means that there is some, some other stresses going on with the tree. And it's not necessarily going to survive a long time. And so I would recommend at least preparing yourself mentally for planting a new one in the space. All right, thanks, Kyle. Uh, Jeff, one picture on this one. Uh, this is a viewer who transplanted uh, seedlings, one oak and three peach trees. She's wanting to know uh, whether she should plant them out at the farm, which is in Kearney County, this fall or wait until next spring. Well, it really depends on the follow-up care. So if, it's, if you're in a position to, you know, Cage them, water them through the winter months. Uh, fall is not a terrible time to do some planting. Uh, if you're not in that position and you want to make sure they get through the winter, then I would wait till spring. And again, but you're still going to have to cage the plants and protect them and water them th then through the spring <coughs> and the summer months. Yeah. Uh, the fall allows maybe the root systems to get a little established over the winter time. So, you know, and I think with anything like this, so I'm a great seed collector and grow plants and all that stuff. And, you know, a quarter of the time, the plant I'm growing from seed is something I want to keep, and the rest of the time, it's not anything I'm going to want. And I think sometimes when we're collecting something like this, uh, something like a peach seedling, you know, don't expect it necessarily to be the peach that you had, that you collected it from. So they, you know, those varieties, those attributes don't tend to follow the seedlings like we think that they would. So anyway, just kind of be prepared for something a little different than what you, what you took the peach from to begin with. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, one picture on the next one. This is an Elkhorn viewer. They had a buckeye that they got this spring. They're wondering when they should do the pruning to create a single leader on this one. I would wait till next spring. So sometime after late February, I would do that. But right now, allow the leaves and, and all that to help build energy in that plant for next year and then do that pruning early next spring. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Well, you know, crab apples are a wonderful addition to a lot of landscapes, lots of beauty for multiple seasons. They also occasionally, or more than occasionally, need a lot of tender loving care. So here's our very own Jeff to talk about what to do with those pruning shears on crab apples. Crab apples are a very common tree in our landscape. If you don't have one in your yard, you might want to think about it. They can fill a lot of niches. 
Uh, there's larger crab apples, there's smaller crab apples, some are upright, some are spreading, some are weeping. So they can do a lot of things. Typically they have lovely flowers in the spring, anywhere from pink, white, red to yellow. Uh, and then they set fruit later in the year that's very ornamental and sometimes the birds like that as well later in the year. And you can expect some decent fall color from them as well. So they really fill a lot of uses for us in our landscape. Um, and they also um, require a little bit of pruning as you go through the year. What I like to do with crab apples, especially uh, if I'm gonna have to do much pruning with them, is to look at doing all my pruning in the summertime. So sometime after the 4th of July, we'll look at coming in and taking out things like the things that you'll commonly face with a crab apple is something like a sucker. So that's coming off of the rootstock. Most of our crab apples are grafted, so that way you have uniformity in the, in the plant. So you can always expect when you buy a particular crab apple, it'll always look the same. So sometimes a rootstock will sucker, so we want to make sure that we take those off. Uh, there's something called a water sprout. So again, if there's been a lot of growth up in the canopy in the tree, you might see a lot of random growth, and those are typically our water sprouts. And then if we have any dead or dying or crossing branches, uh, we'll want to take those out as well. So we want to look at doing our pruning in the midsummer to help reduce the response of the plant to the pruning. So when you prune a plant, many times it'll respond by accelerating its growth and putting on a lot of additional new branches and suckers. If we do it in the midsummer, it'll help reduce that. The plant doesn't respond as strongly to that. So that's with crab apples. We like to do our pruning this time of year to help reduce that response to that. But anyway, so you go through the plant, you take a look at everything, you want to look for crossing and dead branches, broken branches, and take out any suckers, water sprouts that I talked about earlier, uh, and then kind of stick, stand back, make sure that the shape, you're maintaining the shape that you desire with the plant as well. So when we're doing our pruning, make sure you have your safety glasses and your gloves, so again, you don't have any accidents. Uh, nice, clean, sharp pruners when you get started pruning on any plant. Uh, if you're having to use a saw, make sure that you're careful using any of the saws that you might need if you have a bigger branch. Um, again, using the saw can be a little dangerous. Try to avoid working too high above your head. If it's something that's really large, that's uh, probably an indication that you need to call a, an arborist in to have them look at the plant. And if you do have crab apples, take Jeff's advice. Take a look right now. Do that pruning on those crab apples now before fall sets in. Right. All right. So, Kate, we have the next round of questions. You have two pictures on this first one. Uh, and this is fun because she, she found this. This is uh, Fort Calhoun. She found this egg mass on a window, and she thought it was a leaf, and then she realized it was eggs, half an inch wide, half tall so not much and then she sent a follow-up picture because this is what emerged so <laughs> little babies <laughs> what is that yeah so I suspect that these are cutworm caterpillars um, they've probably already dispersed by now but I mean unless you're seeing issues they will feed on ornamental plants and in vegetable gardens and they get their name cutworm because they'll cut the plants right at the soil line and then they'll feed on the plant that wilts. So unless you're seeing that honestly nothing to worry about. I think the caterpillars are pretty cute and if you do start seeing that damage the best thing you can do is clean up that debris and kind of expose them to predators like birds, wasps, etc. All right, thanks, Kate. Uh, one picture on the next one. This comes to us also from Western Oto. This is New Jersey tea plant, and they think this is eggs. What's this one? Um, so these are definitely eggs from one of the bugs. The picture's not quite clear enough, and it looks like they've hatched, but I think it might be from some sort of assassin bug. Um, so something that's predatory, it's not going to hurt the plants. We get some really cool looking assassin bugs here in Nebraska, like the wheel bug and the ambush bug, but I think that's probably what these are. All right, and two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Blair. They're seeing so many of these, like a ladybug, but bigger. What are they? I love these. We have so many great pictures this week. Um, these are Argus tortoise beetles. 
Um, so ladybugs are predatory. Tortoise beetles are actually leaf beetles, so they do feed on leaves. And these ones feed on plants that are in the morning glory family, particularly bindweed, um, sometimes sweet potato. So if you have those host plants around, that's where they're coming from. And then once again, if you have concerns, unless you're actively seeing any damage, there's not really anything you have to do about. This is the stage that overwinters, so they're just kind of in this dormancy period until they find shelter. All right, thanks, Kate. Terry, your first question has one picture. This comes to us from Omaha. It's a little bit of a follow-up. Uh, she did let this plant bloom. She wants to know, uh, is this goosefoot and is it edible? Uh, yes, this is goosefoot. Um, it used to be in a different family, um, but it is now in the amaranth family. And I did look it up. And yes, Native Americans used to use this. Um, they would ground, grind up the seed for a flower, but I would not recommend that because you don't know what's been sprayed on it or anything. So... Um, but, yep, yeah, it's just a weed, so just remove it. All right. Uh, next one, you have one picture also. This is Llewellyn. And uh, uh, it's not a real clear picture, but she does say this is um, choking out the grass. Yeah, I think this is a spurge, and it is not the one that we normally look at, the spotted spurge. I think this is either ground spurge or ridge, ridge spurge because they don't normally have any kind of markings on them. So you're going to treat them like you would with spurge. Um, they, you can go out and pull it. They usually will only have like a, a tiny tap root. But if you have this, I would probably just use a um, Trimac on it to try to get rid of it out of the turf. All right. And one picture on the next one. And this is Bellevue. And it's not really a question. He wants to uh, just show that he has a lawn that is a mix of turf and clover and comment on the positive nature of that? So we have lots of people that have been asking about doing like micro clover lawns and stuff, which I think is fantastic. But here in Nebraska, I think it would be very hard because they're actually going to die back almost completely to the ground. So doing something like this would be really great. You're going to be able to get those flowers to help the pollinators, um, but it's not going to be completely... Um, overrun by the clover so you're going to have turf over the winter and be able to pre protect the soils and those kinds of things so you know having a little bit of a mix in your turf really isn't all that bad i have uh, clover and violets in my turf so and it's kind of pretty <laughs> all right thanks terry kyle one picture on the first one here this is from norfolk uh, small celebrity tomatoes, and at the bottom of the plant, they are looking like this. They're wondering, will it spread, and should they destroy it? Yeah, I uh, had a bit of a hard time figuring out exactly what, what's going on here. It does look like some of the lesions are kind of sunken, um, which would lead kind of lead us into the, the alternaria side of things, our alternaria fruit rots. Um, the nice thing about alternaria is it can infect really any stage of the fruit. And so from the green all the way to, to a nice and mature, nice and mature fruit. Typically it's alternary is not a major, a major problem, but it will allow for secondary stuff to, to come in. The other possibility is a bacterial spot um, on, the, on these as well. Bacterial spot often has a green halo, but on green tomatoes, we don't really have that halo effect. So it's one or, one or the other, it will spread. Um, and so if you don't want tomatoes looking like this, you don't have to cut out a bunch of spots, um, then I would probably get rid of them. All right, and Kyle, you have two, two pictures, two different viewers. The first is from Carlton. Uh, the second one, we don't know exactly where he's from, but one looks like this, and the second picture looks like that. What is that? This is Blossom Enderot. And if, uh, I really like the second picture as well because there's a lot of fuzzy stuff growing in the middle of that blackened blossom end where it's all rotted. That fuzzy stuff is all secondary fungi. It's and so it's the, um, but yeah, it's not, not a disease. It's really, it's a, it's a, it's a moisture issue. And with the moisture that we've been having, at least in Lincoln, it's, it was really dry and then we would get a really heavy rain and then it dries out and heavy rain. And so we, we see blossom end rot when we have uneven moisture and that uneven moisture is preventing the calcium 
from entering into that fruit. Lack of calcium in the fruit causes that blossom end to rot. All right. Thanks, Kyle. And one picture on this next one. Uh, this is uh, north of North Platte. She does cucumbers in a containers every year. This is the first time she's seen this. Her initial concern was these strange white flowers, but also the spots and everything on the cucumbers. She did send a follow-up that said the white flowers have turned into something that is clearly not a cucumber. Uh, <laughs> because that's good because these do not look at all like cucumber flowers. Um, so I, I'm really not sure what's going on there. And I think they had also mentioned that they they replace the soil fairly often. So doing a lot of things right, but it's pretty easy to move a seed. And there are a lot of things that can move seeds and drop seeds. Now, as for the, the leaf spots that we were seeing on those cucumbers, to me that looked like um, angular leaf spot. And that's caused by a bacteria. So really not, not a whole lot to do. Um, try to try to let those leaves um, try to really let those leaves dry out before we're adding any more any more water. And then if the leaves if we're, if we're seeing a lot of infection on the leaves, just go ahead and pluck them off. But with our bacterial diseases, there's really nothing that we can spray on those. All right. Uh, Jeff, you have uh, on the first one here. you've got this is from Lod Lodgepole. This is Frontenac grapes. And uh, he says the grapes are splitting. A lot of the fruit did not set. They had lots of rain this spring in the western part of the state. So what can we actually tell him about that? Yeah, splitting on grapes is a common thing, and it's very environmental. Um, you know, it can be caused by too little moisture, too much moisture, too much heat, too little heat. Uh, just the variability of our, of our environment can affect that. So... Um, you know, you might hear one person say, well, my grapes have been really dry and we had fruit splitting or they've been over too wet and having the same effect. So I think that's just what we've got going on here. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Grand Island and this is a uh, lilac. And he said they came out, they flowered, then they started doing this. And I know you have a lot of lilacs on campus. Yeah. Yeah, so our lilacs have very fibrous and ra rather shallow root systems. Um, and so they are susceptible to drying out quite quickly. And, and they're also kind of tough in that they won't show that damage until almost it's too late, until you walk out <laughs> one day and the plant's brown. Um, mm -hmm. And so I suspect that's probably what we have going on here, that, you know, you were worried about it. It came out, leafed out nicely, flowered nicely, and maybe wasn't thinking that we have to give supplemental watering to an established plant. But I think that's it probably dried out. So I, think it's, I don't think it's dead. I think it's, you know, start watering it. Keep, keep track of your watering. Don't overwater it. Um, maybe do some cleanup pruning on something that looked like there were some broken branches in there. Clean that up, and I think we'll be good to go. All right, Jeff. And two pictures on this last question. This is an opening day viburnum. Uh, she planted this last fall. She said it started sort of dying out branch by branch. She's a little concerned about the red on the edges, but this is a viburnum that does that. Right. So what do you think is going on here? You know, this is a plant that, um, and like a lot of our uh, shrubs, that enjoys a more acidic soil. So this may be one that you want to go in and incorporate some compost, maybe even some peat moss around it. See if we can do that to uh, improve the pH around it. And then that might help invigorate this plant, give it a, give it a second chance. So. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Well, of course, we've had a fabulous season in the garden, and we have wonderful containers in beautiful color. Here's Terry James to tell us what's going on in the Backyard Farmer Garden this week. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to take a break from looking at our new 2023 plants, and we're going to look at how our containers are looking this summer. And I must say, even though I may be a little biased, they are looking fantastic. As you can see, we've put an array of different plants in this. Lots of coleuses, lots of begonias, but we've really made sure that the colors match. Lots of different textures in these and we have lots of heights. We've even added a little bit of greenery by adding some celery to some of our containers. 
So kind of those bright green pops of just those leaves from that celery. And remember, some of these containers can add vegetables. So if you're looking at thinking about your containers for next year, think about adding a couple vegetables. Lots more are being bred specifically for container size. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Welcome back to Backyard Farmer. Coming up later in the show, we're going to see a green wall project, and that will be pretty interesting to look at. This is a taped show, so remember you cannot call in your questions. You can still send them to byf at unl.edu for a future show. Right now, of course, it is time for Plants of the Week, and that is a beautiful combination despite what you told me about the colors. That's yes, right. Well, I think if you're a, a Vikings fan, you'd probably love this combination. <laughs> but um, So what we have here is, so we, ha we do have a nice combination in the sense that uh, they're compatible plants, and you wouldn't necessarily think of them as being compatible plants. Mm -hmm. So the clematis, uh, so we have Radar Love clematis, so it grows, oh, what, like eight feet a year or so, something like that. So it's really pretty clematis. I like the flower. You see the, the fuzzy seed heads that it has with it. We have the budlia, so the butterfly bush here as well. And then we have this tall prairie blazing star. And so the fun thing about this is you would not normally think of some of these plants, especially the liatris, being compatible. But this is one that actually can handle fairly moist soils. So a lot of times when you, again, if you're talking about having uh, a landscape in your front yard and you want to com combine these, this is one that you actually can combine really well. Normally, a liatris, you wouldn't want to have someplace where a clematis needs more moisture. This one actually can handle it. So good job, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, two questions for you, Kate, for this first one. Uh, these are snails, and we know they're not insects, but he wonders what they are and why they showed up. Um, I can't tell you what type of snail it is, but it is a snail. Um, we usually don't see snails as issues in turf grass. Sometimes we do get snail and slug damage on ornamental plants, but if you're not seeing any of that, I wouldn't be really concerned about it. It's probably just the rain washed them out or something environmental. All right, uh, Kate, two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Scribner. We went back and forth on this a little. We had a question without pictures. Yeah. Um, what do we think this is? I think this is probably one of the ones where you're going to need to bring in a sample. Um, there could be herbicide damage, environmental reasons. There's lots of different insects, you know, spider mites. There's the spruce needle miner. Um, we'd probably just need a closer look for this one. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one. They come to us from two different uh, places. We have Scribner and we have Norfolk and they sent pictures of the same thing. One is on a newly planted globe willow chewing away and the other one was in the helicopter hangar. Yeah, these are beautiful um, cottonwood borer beetles, but they are borers. The adults will, you know, chew on the smaller, younger shoots, um, but it's the larvae that you really have to look out for. They chew underneath the bark in the wood, kind of at that root collar zone, and they will weaken trees, make them more susceptible to like weather damage. Um, you know, as far as management, um, July is probably a good time if you wanted to spray the tree. If you wanted to get creative when the larvae are young, you can probably see the cracks in the, in the bark and pull them out around September. Um, but it's also really important just to keep the tree healthy in general to help it sustain, uh, sustain you know what I meant. <laughs> keep it safe from borer damage. All right, Kate, and one more picture. This comes to us from Burwell. Uh, new candles have formed on the Austrian pines, and then here comes this hole, and then the candle turns brown. Yeah, so this is another moth. This is the pine shoot tip moth. Um, and so what this moth does, the caterpillar will go into the shoot, as its name suggests, and then it'll move up to the buds, kind of in the middle of summer, and it causes those buds and the tips to die. Um, they're active from April to August, so you kind of have a large time frame and window to treat. Best time is in April when they're first moving from bud to bud. Um, but one thing that's really easy to do if it doesn't hurt the tree too much aesthetically is to prune and destroy um, because they will go from you know bud to bud and shoot to shoot. Otherwise, you can still treat this month and you should get you know adequate control too. All right, thanks, Kate. Terry, you have one picture on this first one. 
Uh, she wants to know what this weed is, grows and spreads prolifically in moist, shady areas. She's tried pulling, digging, and then she put preen on afterwards. She wonders what it is and what will kill it. <laughs> so this is bittercress. So it is kind of a plurif plurific weed. Um, it's in the Brassicaceae family. It's going to be a winter annual. So you actually need to put the, the pre-emerge down first of September. Um, that should help. Um, you can use kind of a three-way um, herbicide on it, uh, but I would probably wait till it starts to cool down here in a little bit. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one, Terry. And this is, what are these and how do we destroy them? And I think it's this one, and then you have a second picture on this. Yeah, so this is in the Solanaceae, Solanaceae family, so that's related to potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, all those. But this is horse nettle. Um, do not eat it. Um, everything on this plant would be toxic. Um, remove it. Make sure that you have rubber gloves or, or gloves on when you remove it. All right. And to control from coming back, what do we um, do? Control would be make sure you do not let it go to seed. It's going to have lots and lots of seeds in those kind of uh, um, round tomato looking like um, fruit. And uh, you can put a pre-emerge down next summer because it would be a summer annual but um maybe some uh, glyphosate or something to be able to get on it all right uh one picture on the next one and she's found this vine in her flowers uh and she does say it's going to be flowering soon and of course we're seeing this all over the place yeah so this is sometimes kind of a fun plant just because it can grow so much so far so big so quickly this is bird cucumber it's going to have kind of a funky little a uh, whole bunch of seeds kind of packed into it when it flowers. Um, you can just kind of pull it. It's an annual. It's related, again, to the cucumber and the cubaceae family. But um, you can also use a glyphosate on it or a broadleaf weed killer if you want to. But it's usually easiest if you can track it down to where it's at, pull it, and then kind of watch it and enjoy it dying on the <laughs> ground. All right. And one more picture, and this comes to us from Ogallala. He wonders uh, what this is. This is looks like prickly lettuce. It's kind of in and amongst some other stuff, but this would be in the sunflower family, so related to um, some of the other thistles that we have. But this one, make sure that you have a glove. Um, pull it out. It's They're pretty easy to pull. Um, if you have some drier area, which is kind of where this area is, looks like it might not get a lot of moisture, uh, go get your soil knife and dig it out. All right. Don't let it go to seed. Exactly. Okay, Kyle, uh, first picture here, and I know this is way cool. It's the first one we've gotten. This is Bellevue. He thinks it's slime mold, and he comes back every year. He wonders how to get rid of it. Well, he's right. It is slime mold. Don't get rid of it. It's super fun. Um, in fact, what he could do is he could pour out Gatorade or pop or something like that across his yard and watch the slime mold follow those sugars across the, across the landscape. It works. I, I did that last summer. Um, but yeah, really, it's not, it's, not at, it's not harming the grass. I don't mean to be flippant, um, but it's not, not harming the grass at all. It's just one of those things when we have moisture like we've had, those, those slime molds will show up. When it dries out, you have weather like, like right now where it's not raining, um, but it'll dry out. You can just go and kick it, and, or you can blast it with, uh, with a hose. All right. Uh, one picture on the next one, Kyle. This is from Papillion. Mm -hmm. She found these in her raised bed. What are these? This is wolf's milk slime. And so another, another type of slime mold, um, Lycogala epidendrum is the scientific name of this but again just another not not a true fungus but it is feeding on some some woody material down there and not causing any problems just one of those really cool things that pops up all right two pictures on the next one uh this is diablo nine bark she said it about eight years started to get the white powder on it and she wonders what to do so it never comes back again the white powder or the nine bark? Uh, yes. Because the, <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the the white powder is going to be powdery mildew. Really, not a whole lot that you can do um, to to prevent that. Aside from, I would may, maybe do some pruning, but with nine barks, especially when they're once they've once they're really bushy like that, 
it's going to be hard to get the air flow through the canopy, and that will, that will um, allow that fungus to, to proliferate. Um, I think they also mentioned that it had done some pruning, and maybe stuff wasn't blooming and coming back near as well as it had previously. It's been a hard couple of years to be a plant, and I, I really think that's the issue with this nine bar, because maybe there was, they had pruned a little bit too heavy last year, and it's just going to take a little bit of time for that, for that plant to, re to fully recover. All right, and two picks on the next one. This is clematis leaves here in Lincoln turning brownish. What do you think? Um, yeah, and it's not just in Lincoln. It's pretty widespread. I think this is a root issue, and I don't know exactly what root issue it is, but I've been seeing it on, on a lot of different clematises where almost the entire vine will just have some leaf burning that's occurring. Um, typically, that's going to be an indication of something with, uh, something with the roots. Maybe it's overwatered. Maybe it's too wet. Or, uh, maybe it's not enough water. Could be a um, could be a fertility issue as well. So we, we would need need to know a little bit more. All right, uh, Jeff. Three pictures on the first one here. This comes to us from Wahoo, tulip tree that looked perfectly healthy, and then all of a sudden branch to branch to branch. You have tulip trees on campus. What happened? Yeah, I think it's just I think it's probably last year's dry period and the uh, the winter we had. So and they're susceptible to that. They're used to eastern U.S. weather. So I think um, prune out the dead and make sure that you have, you have it mulched and that you're watering it. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from North Platte. This is Dunstan Chestnut, 8 to 10 years old. He says they'll flower, but they don't set fruit. Right. Yeah, well, you know, we talked about this. Chestnuts produce um, either all male flowers or male and female flowers at the same time. Uh, so they may go several years before producing both flowers. Uh, and I would say at this point, they just haven't done that yet. So I think wait for them to mature, continue to take good care of them. They look great. They're North Platte, so he's doing a lot of things right. I think just be patient. All right, Jeff, uh, two pictures on the next one. This is a big old elm. This is in Omaha. They've had it pruned by a licensed arborist, but... What's going on? Is too much taken out, or what do you think? You know, it's been thin pretty good. I, would, uh, I wouldn't do any more pruning at this stage. It sounds like they might have elm leaf beetle problems as well. So, you know, I think it's another, again, environment, kind of what we've had going on here lately. Be patient. It's green to the tips, it looks like to me, so I, that's a good sign. So I think just keep an eye on it at All this right. stage. And one more picture. This comes to us from Silver Creek. Crab apple uh, had leaves turning brownish or reddish, but this is what the base of that tree looks like. Yeah, so it, the plant looks like it's been, the tree's been planted too deeply, um, and there's probably not much you can do about it at this time. So I would say, you know, I would cut my losses and go ahead and replace the plant. If that's a crab apple you really like, get it, and then make sure you plant it at the right height the next time. All right, thank you, Jeff. Well, last week, Richard Sutton gave us a look at his green roof project at his home. This week, we're going to take a look at how that green roof feeds into his green wall and his rain garden, see how that great system works in his landscape. The green wall and the rainwater garden are all connected with the green roof. The idea here is to have a treatment train demonstrated. The green roof, which we just talked about, is uh, at the top, and it drains eventually through the gutter system down into the rainwater garden. The green wall is a uh, interesting feature in that it's on the east-facing wall, and it has to use plants that grow in partial shade. It only gets uh, about three or four hours of sunlight during the day. So we had to be very careful with the plants that we chose. It's a system of woven geotextile with pockets that then is drip irrigated along the top and it's drip irrigated every day. The excess water from that then runs into the rainwater garden. Uh, the rainwater garden has some of your typical rainwater uh, plants in it, whereas the green wall is made up of all native plants, it really becomes more like a wet meadow. It has a number of sedges, it has things like uh, um, columbine, it has wild onion, uh, strawberry, 
those kinds of plants that you would see along the margins of a prairie. The green wall system is a proprietary system that's made of a mesh of stainless steel uh, with woven geotextile pockets that hold the media and the plants within it. The idea behind the geotextile is it allows moisture to percolate all the way down through the wall. So when we run the drip system, we need to run it all the way so that it drips out at the bottom to make sure that the lower plants are getting moisture. It runs every day. The idea here is to demonstrate a treatment train for stormwater. It's obviously clean water when it falls from the rain, but this slows it down and moves it through roof, green wall, down to the rainwater garden. Now the system that's been used for the green wall, like I said, is a proprietary system and is fairly expensive. So there are other options on the market and I would suggest that folks are interested in those that they do their, uh, do their research and figure out what might work best for them. One proviso, and that's true for the green wall and the, uh, and the green roof, is that using these native plants, we have kind of a dead spot during April and May when it's returning from uh, dormancy and hasn't really started to grow yet. Looks great now, but in May it looked a little bit peaked because it was, uh, you know, it was just recovering from dormancy. We want to say thanks to Richard for sharing those projects with it. A lot of fun, pretty interesting, and it looks like, you know, maybe a little bit of work. <laughs> All right, so we have one, we have one announcement tonight, and that is uh, Daylily Days, which is coming up, I think, right now, July 5th to 22nd. So this is Harmony Nursery and Daylily Farm in Bradshaw. And finally, those daylilies a lot of people have are beginning to bloom. All right, uh, one last round of picture questions. Kate, your very first question here has one picture. This comes to us from Tabor, Iowa. She found these three husks in the crook of branches on a willow tree. She's wondering, uh, there was sawdust in the crook, but she didn't see anything else going on. What is this and will it hurt the tree? So these are pupil cases from a moth, probably the willow clearwing moth. So those are really closely related to that um, peach tree borers that I talked about earlier. So they are borers. The good news is that willow trees, pretty they, they withstand this moth pretty well. Usually there's not a lot of things that you have to do. But you know, as I mentioned with any of these tree borers, keep the tree healthy. That's gonna make it less susceptible. So make sure it's well watered, have that mulching, and then you should be good to go. All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Omaha. She wonders about identification of this bee. She's been fighting the good fight with carpenter bees, and she wants the pollinators, but she doesn't want the carpenters. Yeah, so it's not a carpenter bee. Um, it might be a squash bee. That might be a squash flower. Um, I'm not a flower person, but maybe. Um, so the carpenter bees, the type that you have to look out for in Nebraska, are the ones that almost look exactly like bumblebees. You know, same size, same color, but their abdomens are shiny. Um, either way, carpenter bees, you should treat their nest directly, so you don't need to be doing anything broad spectrum in the garden, um, so that helps protect the other bees, but this one you don't have to worry about. All right, and your last picture is the one you've been anticipating. This comes to us from Plainview. She found this on a shrub that she purchased. What is this? Yeah, so once again, Moth Week is coming up. We've had a lot of moths today. This is a caterpillar of the Cecropia moth that I showed as my sample earlier. So these giant silk moths have really large green caterpillars. They have a lot of ornate little spikes or hairs on them, and they're really beautiful. They feed on lots of different types of deciduous trees so we can see them in forests pretty often and if it was me i would let this caterpillar do its thing you'll see it form one of those cocoons and then maybe next year you'll have a beautiful moth i love it all right thank you kate terry you have two pictures on the first one here this comes to us from west side they removed two ash trees they got new soil they put in tall fescue and then they found this what's this <laughs> So this could be like the first question that we had. You had soil brought in, so you could potentially have had some seed in this. But I think this is one of the forage fescues. Um, 
th really the only thing that you're going to be able to do with this is is use a glyphosate product on this and it's going to have to be kill the whole area and then get rid of it if you have this mixed and then reseed with make sure that you're using certified seeds so you don't have any extra weed seeds or those kinds of things in that when you reseed. All right. Uh, two questions or two pictures on the next one, Terry. This is an Omaha viewer. Uh, she says this is a shallow rooted grass. It pulls up easily. There are no grubs. She's got quality grass growing around it. She keeps raking it to get rid of it. She wants to seed this fall. So she wants to know what to do to get rid of this and then get ready for seed. So you're kind of doing the right thing. This, I believe, is Nimble Will. So kind of a fun name of a grass, Nimble Will. Um, but you can use Tenacity or Mesotrione to get rid of this specifically, and it won't hurt the other turf in there. But make sure that you get them all because it's going to be able to sprout wherever, whatever you leave there and those w and the roots that you leave there. So try to get out out as much as you possibly can. And the birds used it for nesting. Yeah, the birds <laughs> do use it. So that yeah. might be where you got it from, too. All right. Two picks for the next question, Terry. This is a Lincoln viewer. She has a nice turf except for a couple of feet uh, next to the street. She wants to kill the weeds, replant this fall. Lots of different weeds. And she's also got a honey locust that has sprouted in there. So what does she kill what does she, i mean and when does she start the process to get ready for fall seeding so the honey locust i believe is their neighbor's tree so you're gonna it's gonna be one of two things it could be the roots they do have a shallow root system so it could be coming up from the roots or it could be from seed so just keep mowing the the trees down and the other one is prostate not weed i would go ahead and just with your soil knife try to dig that out right now it's you can try to a, a, Dig a herbicide it. to get rid of it if you wanted to. All right, Kyle, two picks on this one. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a hosta, just one that looks like this. We had some back and forth on this. Yeah. What do we think this is and what to do about it? I think this is one where we would need to see more of a sample. It really it looks a lot like um, sunburn, but, uh, but then a lot of secondary stuff that came into it doesn't really make sense with it only being one so I wonder if maybe there's a reflection for that spot maybe off of a window or something like that but we need a little bit more information on this one all right two picks on the next one saw these shrooms and her dog thought they were pancakes so what are they those are there was probably an ash tree there a few years ago as well those are ash tree bull eats. they're not a true bull eat um, but they call them that anyway one of the cool things about them is if you cut them open, they'll actu they actually bruise blue. And so you can cut them open and pinch them and they'll turn blue. They also have a, a symbiotic relationship with the ash tree leaf aphid. And so they will form a sclerotia around the aphid eggs on, um, as the aphids are feeding on the ash tree roots. And then those mushrooms pop up in the spring. All right, one more picture, and this is these shrooms on the west side of the house. Same thing, different verse, something different. Yeah, here I think this is the shaggy-legged ringless amantia mushroom. And so it's one of, a, one of our amanita mushrooms. Um, not, should not be poisonous or toxic, but again, never consume a mushroom unless you know exactly what it is. All right, Kyle, two picks on the first one for you, Jeff, here. This is from West Point. Ran across this plant. Uh, uh, what, uh, what, what is this? Well, this is, you know, I think we're all familiar with Greenbrier. This is um, a carrion flower, so it's related to that. It's a thornless Greenbrier. It's native, so it's a little unusual, kind of fun. All right, this is an unusual one as well, not, not our usual that has thorns. Right, right. Okay, oh. uh, we have one picture on this one. This comes to us from Plymouth, Indiana, Northeast uh, Nebraska viewer originally. And uh, what is this? This is a variegated calla lily. So once it flowers, you'll be able to tell what variety it is. So it'll either be a purple or white or yellow flower, something like that. So. All right. And two picks for your very last question. This comes to us from Hamburg, Iowa. Pink hydrangea, not blooming, looking crummy. What's the deal? You know, again, kind of going back to some of the other answers, I think we need to look at the soil, bringing in some compost, some, some peat moss, 
kind of helping the soil a little bit. Make sure that we're not pruning it uh, in the spring. This blooms on old wood, so um, making sure that we don't do that. All right. Thank you, Jeff.